What's up guys, you join me in England, in Hattel, Norwich, the home of Lotus, the birthplace of pure sports cars and we're here to check this out. So we're here to find out two things. Is it still a Lotus sports car? And how does this new four-cylinder AMG turbo feels in the Amira? But before that, let's first look at the exterior of the car and my goodness, let me just sum up. It is so beautiful. It's got supercar looks without necessarily costing supercar money. So in terms of exterior design, the Amira is heavily influenced by Lotus's 2,000 horsepower Aviha hypercar. The other section of the Amira that's been heavily influenced by the Aviha hypercar is this section here. Check out the cutouts. It makes the car look so dramatic, almost like a sculpture. I'm also a huge fan of this swooping ducktail spoiler. And check this out, a Lotus with a remote boot release. And then check out the boot. You might be able to fit one cabin size luggage in there or two duffel bags or two backpacks. What I'm not too crazy about is this section here. Unlike the V6 model where you can actually see the real engine cover, this one with the four-cylinder AMG turbo engine actually comes with a huge plastic piece. I think most of us would prefer to see the actual engine itself. One of the inconveniences of owning a Lotus, like for example the Elise S2 that I have, is getting in and out of the car. That's because the door seal, this piece here, is actually higher than the seats. So your ties are actually lower than this. But in this, it's the complete opposite. Let me show you how easy it is to get in and out of this car. And that's it. Whereas before, like in the Elise S2 for example, I actually have to teach my passengers how to get in and out of the car and some of them have not been able to get out because of how cramped it is. Moving inside, it is undoubtedly one of the most luxurious Lotus interiors I have ever been in. You now have two digital screens, one in front of the driver, one for the infotainment system. Let me just switch it on with this start-stop button here, even though this flap doesn't hold, which can get really annoying. The controls are really responsive. Check out how Apple CarPlay immediately comes on since I have connected earlier. And then you have other driving data here like your G meter, your output, your boost, your lap time, your fuel consumption, and also navigation. So you've got your drive mode selector here to access three different drive modes. And as you can see, the character of the car changes with different modes. I also like that the armrest is nicely positioned so that while you're cruising, you can actually be in a very relaxed position. And then at the back here, as you can see from my shopping bag, it's actually more room for another two duffel bags. Finally, you can bring your better half on a road trip with you. The only thing I like to point out is this, because as you can see, the movement of the gear lever is not the most common, so it does take a bit of getting used to. Now, enough talking about the car. Let's go drive it on the road, and then they're going to let us take it out for a spin on the Hattel. And this is the one with the sports pack, so stiffer suspension. Basically, the more extreme of the two packages. So you have the tour pack, you have the sports pack. The tour pack is supposed to be more comfort oriented, something you can use daily. And even though this is supposedly the one with the stiffer suspension, man, it's comfortable. We are on English B roads. We went through a few rough patches. There. That's all you get. This is such a different Lotus. I don't know if you heard that, but my goodness. It's quite intoxicating if you ask me. In terms of excitement, there is nothing more exciting than knowing that you have the most powerful four-cylinder engine just behind you. So driving on these really narrow English B roads really gives you a sense of how wide the car is, um, which it's not. I mean, you don't feel like you have to manage the car a lot to keep the car in the lane. In terms of visibility, <sighs> I have not had so much visibility in a Lotus before, in any Lotus vehicle before. The biggest change here 
in the Lotus is the refinement because I have had the privilege to drive uh, the Exige, the Evora, spent a lot, a lot of time in the Lotus Elise S2. Refinement has been the main thing that is lacking in all those cars, especially the Elise S2, the Exige. I think just from the sheer fact that it has two different engine options and three different transmission options, that kind of tells you that Lotus is trying to make this car versatile. You know, people who drive Golf GTIs, Audi TTs, that kind of stuff, you know, they want to upgrade to a supercar, uh, but don't necessarily have the means to get a Ferrari. Well, this is actually a viable option now. Oh, it is an absolute monster, man. I mean, I've not gone full throttle in it yet, but I can already tell you that it's a monster waiting to be unleashed at the back. It is caged in at the moment because we are driving on normal public roads, but wait till we get on the track. Oh my goodness. I think in terms of, I've only spent like what, maybe 10 minutes in this car and I've, I'm, I'm already sold. I am convinced that this car is completely unlike any other Lotus that has existed before this. And now, not only you can own this, even if you don't know how to drive a manual, even if you are bigger, you are twice my size, three times my size, you can actually own one now. You can actually get in and out without worrying about getting stuck. You don't have to worry so much about headroom, leg room, knee room. There's plenty of space at the back and just so much more practical aspects to it. All right, I'm downshifting to second. Oh my goodness. It's not just incredibly fast, but there's also that sense of that old school turbo in the way it delivers the power. You get everything. And then after that, you take a break while you change gears and then you get everything again. Whew. Okay, so now we're on slightly more open roads. I have been in comfort mode or what they call tour mode. I'm gonna put it into sports. Uh, instantly you hear more drama at the back. It gets a little louder. I think because it has two different engine options, three different transmission options, it actually allows you to decide what this car is for. Why are you buying it? <laughs> okay, back to what I was saying. But if you are planning to drive it a bit more often, you can opt for the V6 automatic. But if you want to tinker with the car, if you want to drive it on the track a bit more, you want it to be a bit more aggressive in the way it changes gears, in the way it delivers the power. This, the four-cylinder AMG engine with the dual clutch gearbox. Look at these beauties just parked in the middle of a really small rural old town. Don't they just stick out like sore thumbs? So we've just driven out of a very, very small town and as we were driving by really slowly, you have pedestrians just staring and almost gawking at us, man. Kids with smiles on their faces, with looks of excitement. And I think that's ultimately the goal of this. And I think that's the effect that this car has. Like I said, it doesn't cost a lot of money. I mean, when you compare in the grand scheme of things, this is probably the cost of a BMW M2, you know, um, without tax, but you get this supercar driving dynamics. It's like no other, actually. It's like no other. Compared to the Lotus that I'm used to, the Elise S2, the steering definitely doesn't feel as raw and direct. It still uses the hydraulic steering system, but it is now power assisted. Still, quite communicative and it tells you sufficiently what the car is going through and that's what you want. Now, to the main event. Test driving the Amira on the iconic Hetto test track in the home of Lotus.
Coming out of the pits, straight away, you can hear the ferocity of the most powerful four-cylinder engine in the world, as if it's already hinting to you what a monster it can be. This being our first ever lap on the world-famous test track, we were mindful not to go too hard and took our time to learn the track with an instructor in the lead car. After just the lap, it was obvious how much power the Emira had, how nimble and lively it felt, all the hallmarks of a Lotus. What might not be obvious, this was a very technical test track, and it should be. That's why Lotuses drive so well. Now we're really letting loose. The car was so communicative and lively through the corners, it just came alive. It's so full of emotion. Mira's steering felt very direct and it was really eager to change direction, just like the smaller Lotuses from before. Hugging these swooping corners, the car gave so much confidence, with so much feedback from the suspension, as if it's letting you know where the limit is. Another stretch to experience the Emira's performance before we went hard on the brakes and realised just how nimble this car was on tighter bends. The last turn at Hettel was probably the trickiest. Get it right and you'd actually come out side by side with the wall. It can be quite intimidating. Here from the tire squealing, you can really drive this car, really push it because there's so much feedback, whether from the steering, from the body movements, it's like Christmas for the sensors. Driving the Amira makes you feel like you're dancing with a seasoned partner. There's a sense of telepathy, confidence, and understanding between car and driver that you simply can't get with other supercars. It's so forgiving, allowing you to reach the limits of the car and yet still play with it there. And the sensations you get are immense and simply endless. That to me is the most Lotus a Lotus can be. The Amira is like the greatest hits album of Lotus from the last three decades. It may not be as light as before, but it's a combination of all that's great about Lotus since the Elise S1. But now, it's even more mature with a hint of modern practicality. What a car! <laughs>